a shroot part one? Okay. Okay, so this is going to, uh, this lecture, no, we can't do the joke yet. So this uh, series of lectures or shirim will cover Hilchot Shabbat, the laws of Shabbat. Uh, this is going to be focused on the 39 Avot Melachot, which we'll look into in just a second. Uh, I think, honestly, we're probably going to take at least five classes, maybe more, because it's a lot of material. Um, and there are many other topics related to Shabbat that we can discuss. Uh, I wanted to start off with a quote from Rabbi Yehonatan Ivshutz, who says, One who does not thoroughly study the laws of Shabbat three or four times cannot avoid desecrating Shabbat either with a Torah violation or a rabbinic violation, it is praiseworthy to constantly study the laws. And as we go through the lecture, you'll realize that it is extremely complicated if you want to adhere to a right of center orthodox perspective. I'm not telling you you should do that, but you need to know, you need to be exposed at least to many of these principles, at least for the sake of having uh, interaction with uh, Jews from different backgrounds. I also wanted to include a section from a uh, very famous rabbi, Rabbi Yehuda Arye Lieb, from the 19th century, the uh, early 1800s, 1840s, uh, or also known as the Safat Emet. Uh, we learn that tarnish and blemishes must be removed from metal utensils that are only to be rendered kosher from the word only in the verse, only the gold and the silver from Numbers 31:22. Similarly, only and only keep my Shabbatot in Exodus 31, 13. This teaches us that one must be free, must free himself of his tarnish and blemishes before entering the sanctity of Shabbat. It's before the koshering process. So if... No, 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 you need to take tarnish off. Uh, you'd have to look at the specific case. If it's burned, I mean, if is there something additional on it or if it's just something that's happened to the metal itself? You know, if it's just something that the, me the metal has been bent or altered or something, that's not really the concern here. It's more, the specific context is like tarnish as it applies to silver or gold, you know, like you would use some kind of remover. But the point is that, you know, just as we are vessels, we want to remove all impurities from ourselves when we, we enter to Shabbat. So I think that most of you are familiar with uh, some of the basics regarding the source of the melachot. And um, I actually put this at the end. Um, and I wanted to, oh, I probably did it too fast. Um, couple of, of passages in the Torah itself, which give us the concept of uh, melacha, because the word melacha is the word that is used in the Torah to describe creative work. It is not, uh, okay, so for, for example, in Exodus 20:19 we read, Ve'yom ha'shevi'i Shabbat l'adonai elochecha lo ta'aseh chol melacha. All types of work, or all work, and the context is all types of creative work, which we'll look at in a second. Ata uvincha uvitecha, avdecha veamatcha, urchem techa vegerecha asher bisharecha. But the seventh day is a Sabbath or a Shabbat unto the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any manner of work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor the cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. Now, the other word that is used in the Torah for work is avodah. Avodah is a service. It's the type of service that is related to the Kohanim, for example, in the, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle of the Beit HaMikdash. So we're looking at a different type of work. We're looking at melacha. We're, we're looking at creative work. And that's why the uh, expansiveness of this is, is very uh, 
challenging. Now, since we do not have the Torah explicitly defining what melacha is, uh, the Rabbanim look to different passages in the Torah uh, to look at what the definition of melacha is. In Exodus 35, uh, we are introduced to some basic laws of Shabbat, uh, and then immediately after, uh, the laws or the construction of the, uh, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, are, are discussed, are elaborated. So the rabbis on the principle of juxtaposition, the positioning of the two sections, relate melacha as anything that was involved in the creative work of the Mishkan. In Exodus uh, 36.6, I believe, um, it explicitly states that when people were donating to the building of the Mishkan, that people have donated so much that Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, tell the people not to bring any more. And Moshe Rabbeinu says, and I'll, and I'll quote you that passage here, just to give you context. He says, and Moses gave orders, um, and they caused it to be proclaimed throughout the camp. Let no man or woman create any more work for the uplifted donation of the sanctuary. So the, um, in, in fact, in the Hebrew it says, V'yatsav Moshe v'yaviru kol b'machane lemor ish ve'isha al ya'asu od melacha leterumat ha'kodesh v'yikale ha'am mechavi. So here in Exodus 36.6, we have an explicit connection between the concept of melacha as it relates to the Mishkan. Now in the Talmud, in the Bavli, which is the Babylonian Talmud, in Shabbat, the whole tractate is dedicated specifically to what is malacha, what is prohibited. Uh, in 97b, uh, uh, there is a discussion, actually it should be 39, not 30, apologize for that. 39 categories of work, and these are referred to as the avot melachot. Avot is the word that we use for fathers, from the word av. Uh, and in this case, what it means is it's the father, it's the principal category, and then under that, there are subcategories. So there are 39 uh, classes of work, and then each one has its own subcategory. Now, before we go back and start with specific malachot, I wanted to reference two other passages in the Tanakh, which give us an idea that even though the Torah itself does not specifically delineate what is work and what is not, with a few exceptions, there was an oral tradition that was apparently known by letter generations, and this is proven uh, in Jeremiah, and it's also proven in the book of Nehemiah. So in Jeremiah 17, 21, 22, uh, we read, uh, And then the second verse says, and the translation thus says the Lord, take heed for the sake of your souls and bear no burden on the Sabbath day, nor bring in it in it by the gates of Jerusalem. And then the second verse 22 says, neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day, neither do ye any work. And so we read, Bechol melacha, but hallow ye the Sabbath day as I commanded your forefathers. So here, even though the Torah specifically does not reference this, we have proof that by the time of the Nebi'im, the prophets, there was an understanding of what melacha was. The second uh, biblical text before we return back and look at uh, you know, the, the nitty gritty of, of melachot is found in Nehemiah 13, 15 through 22. It was too much Hebrew, so I just put the English. And I'll read that. In, in those days saw I, uh, you know, Nehemiah speaking, in Judah, some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in heaps of corn, lading asses therewith, also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I forewarned them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, who brought in fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus, and did not our, bro our God bring us all, all this evil upon us and upon the city? Yet ye bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. 
And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, I commanded that the doors should be shut and commanded that they should not be opened till after the Sabbath. And seven of my servants set I, set I over the gates and there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kind of ware lodge without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I forewarned them and said unto them, why lodge ye about the wall? If ye do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. So that's a biblical, uh, a few biblical passages as a basis. And now we'll go back to the very beginning. Sure. The what, I'm sorry? Uh, no, I don't believe it is. Uh, no, I think it's a uh, chet, isn't it? I have to look at the, I'm sorry, I have to look at the, oh, it, it is a chaf. Yeah, you're right. It's a mel. Um, the root would be a, a chaf, but uh, I don't think the, it's connected though. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a chaf. At the end? No, no, no. It's a, it's a chaf. Yeah. All right. So, sorry about getting all the way up here. Okay. So now we're going to get into the 39 Avot Malachot. We're only going to be able to do about six or seven because they're extremely complicated. Uh, and we need to, you know, what I want to do is I want to show you the, the basic breakdown of each one of these. So the first one is Zeria which uh, is where we get the word zera, uh, or zera is a seed. So in the Talmud, in the Bavli, and in the Yerushalmi, there's a whole tractate called zera'im, seeds. It's about planting all of the different laws that are associated with uh, agricultural uh, production. So this is the way that we're going to break down each melacha. We're going to start off with the principle of the melacha, or the melacha. We're going to look at the melacha as it related uh, it, was, it was related to in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle. So we're essentially connecting it to the biblical text. And then we're going to look at what we call the Av Melacha, the principle, the father uh, Melacha, the main one. And then we're going to break it down into the subcategories. So when we get to the Toladot or the Tolados in Ashkenazic pronunciation, this is the generations. These are the subcategories. So because every Melacha has its own category. So there, that's why it gets very complicated. So the first thing is zeria, and the very basic principle is causing the growth of a plant. Now, why would we be concerned about that? Well, because in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, the frame of the Mishkan was covered with sheets that were made from animal skins. You think, well, what does that have to do with planting? Well, the skins were dyed various colors, and those dyes, in turn, were derived from plants. In addition, this planting is the Mishkan source for this malacha. So everything that was involved with the construction of the Mishkan, directly or indirectly, is classified as a melacha, as a creative work. So the principal uh, prohibition is, uh, is related to the uh, sowing seeds, because the seeds would give forth plants, then the plants would be taken, and of course they would be boiled down or treated to give uh, dye that would be used in treating the material that was going to be used in the, Beitam, in the, the Mishkan, and then later the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, now there are four areas uh, or actions that are considered similar to sowing of seeds. The first is planting an actual seedling or sapling. So if you have a little tree and you actually go and plant it, that is effectively considered to be similar enough to planting. The source for this is the Mishneh Torah, Shabbat 8.2. Uh, so I'm trying to give you uh, sources throughout. The second is pruning because it's related to the growth process of a plant. So if you have a guy, you know, pruning, that's prohibited on Shabbat. Grafting, taking one branch and sticking it onto another, that's prohibited. All this is based on the Mishneh Torah. Uh, and then layering. And all of these are ultimately related back to the Babli, the Talmud, but I'm just giving you some, a few uh, sources. So if you're trimming, if you're pruning, if you're arranging a tree, a plant, etc., these are all specific prohibitions. On Shabbat, yes. Uh, 
-hmm. It depends what type of fixing that you were doing. Layering, I think, is more like a, it's like a type of pruning, but trying to make a plant like a certain type of. It's going to be involved. They're all going to be related to cutting that kind of thing. Arranging it, I believe, in the if they're already in water, it's not problematic. If you're taking them out and putting it into, well, you shouldn't pick it. That's one of the prohibitions that we'll see. Yeah. So, so no picking flowers on Shabbat. So toladot is the, the the sons, if you will, the generations, the subcategories. So any action that improves a plant. So if you have your flower and you are effectively uh, trying to improve it, let's say like, you, you, know, you have your, your flower uh, vase, if there's anything that you can do, if you could add food to it, that would be problematic. But this is not uh, an issue if you're just, you know, sort of, uh, you know. Well, rearranging is, that gets into another issue. So there's different issues there. So then the next one is preventing harm to vegetative growth. So if you're covering something, if you're protecting it, you know, maybe there's a, a winter warning, something like that. That's something that is also prohibited because it's indirectly improving the condition that would allow the plant to grow. And we don't want to do that actively. If it happens on its own accord, that's fine. So halachic application. So every one of the melachot I've divided up into this. So in this particular case, it's a lot of information. The first thing is that you should not, and this should be seeds, one should not toss seeds or pits of fruits and vegetables. Let's say you're walking outside, you've eaten a, a, an apple or something, you don't wanna throw it on the ground because technically you are planting seeds, right? And then as we'll see later on, let's say your kids are running on the grass, they're actually pushing seeds into the ground. So actually they're, they're almost as if uh, they're plowing, so to speak, and, I, and this is you know, normative. Um, the next thing is you should avoid eating and drinking in a garden, specifically for the same reason, since the remnants can fall down and cause uh, inadvertent growth. Uh, number three, you should not use any water in the garden that flows along the ground and causes growth. So that's something that, you know, most of these are, are not things that are going to happen um, consciously. A lot of these things happen unconsciously, but it's something that you need to be concerned about. If you're outside, you don't want to wash your hands over earth, even if there are no plants growing in it. So this is a protection against the fact that there may be a plant there. You may be washing your hands, water grows on it, you're, you're inadvertently uh, giving uh, you know, food, if you will, to the plant and helping it grow. Uh, one should not place a pit into a cup of water, nor place a seed in a wet surface, since these can cause the seed to grow. So let's say, for example, that you've got a whole bunch of kids, uh, like a Ben Abraham, and uh, you, you want to show your kid a science project on Shabbat, and you say, hey, I'm going to get a bean, and I'm going to wrap it in cotton, and, you know, just to keep him entertained, that's prohibited. Why? Because it will cause the bean to sprout, and you do not want to cause it to sprout. You don't want to do anything active. Um, the next one, um, we should not place flowers that open in water into a vase with water. So if they're there before Shabbat, that's, you know, that's fine. But if you're, you're doing something to promote that or you're transferring them onto another vase, that's the problem. Uh, one should not change the water or add water to a vase of flowers, even if the flowers do not open, the water, uh, open in water. This is because the new water improves the flower and the flowers, and also because it's, it's part of the, uh, you know, we're, we're, it's the fences concept, right? We don't want to do anything that resembles that because we want to make sure not to violate the principle melacha. All right, so that was pretty simple. So now we get to Kharisha. So we have a picture here of some guy, uh, old style plowing. So these are very practical, but you know, in, in a modern world, huh? It's, it's like to turn over, I think, the ground. And then I'll go back and you know, add the Hebrew eventually. It just, you know, it's, it was a, quite a bit of time. So Kharisha is not just simple direct plowing. It's something that can happen indirectly, as we see by the picture of our sheep. Because you can lead out sheep to pasture, and they can, you know, trample on the ground, and they're sort of cultivating it or getting it ready. So the principle of the, of the malacha is preparing the earth for planting. So that's why we have direct plowing. We have sheep in the, in the, in the, in the field. So in the mishkan, uh, and sorry about the spelling errors, mishkan, uh, dyes used for skins that covered the mishkan were used 
from vegetables. So plowing is the Mishkan source for this malacha. Most of these early malachot are all related to the dying process in, in the Mishkan. So the, the, the principal malacha is plowing a plantable field. So this includes every variation of that, plowing, tilling, cultivating, hoeing, any digging for the purpose of planting seeds. And that's uh, one source is the Mish, uh, Mishneh Torah, Shabbat. Uh, the melacha includes plowing with an animal. It also includes attaching the needed tools to the animal. So let's say that uh, you're not planning to plow, but you have your horse or your ox or whatever, and you sort of hitch them up, ready to go, even though you're not intending to do so. That is prohibited. There's no reason for you to do that. So that's related to this malacha. Harisha, uh, the toladot or the tolados of harisha include the following. Removing sticks and stones from a field because you're improving the field, getting it ready for planting. Uh, breaking up clumps of earth. You might do that with your feet. You know, you might do that if you're running, etc. cetera. Uh, manuring a field. And the picture that I, sh uh, I, I showed on the previous slide of the sheep, uh, you know, if the sheep go into the field, they're probably going to be eating and they're going to be processing manure. Now, if your intent is to take advantage of that, you're violating it because you are taking it, you know that they're going to do that and you're getting the field ready for planting. If the intention is to plant. Now, some people that are stricter, they won't run on grass. Uh, if that is, you know, because that might be an indirect effect. Uh, but I mean, like, you know, there's no, it's got like, there's not really an issue for the most part here. The what? Yeah. In a stricter community, maybe running on, you know, grass might be an issue. You would want to do it. Uh huh. Well, I'm not saying that they wouldn't run, but I mean, they might be more conscious. Yeah, they might be more conscious of that. You know, and there are different communities. That everyone's going to have stricter levels, et cetera. But that's something that you, you should be aware of. Yeah, and they're not. Yeah, but walking is one thing. If you're running, that's like a different category. So. Yeah, but that's that's. It's not the intent to break it. But if you're running, the chances are that it will happen more. Yeah, I mean, well, I don't know that it would be a minchag. I would, you know, for that particular community, it would have the weight of, of halacha. But there, you know, there might be different interpretations. Some people, it's a different topic. We'll get to that. But we would, you know, some people allow people to ride bicycles on Shabbat and some people don't. So, you know, but they're all derived from the same source. But I wouldn't say it's just customary. It wouldn't, yeah. So, uh, manuring the field. Um, and then digging irrigation ditches. Now, this would be something that a child would do. If it's muddy outside and they take a stick, you know, they're making lines in the, in the, in the dirt because they want to see the water run. That would be something that would be technically prohibited, you know, so. Huh? Well, technically speaking, I mean, you know, any child that's three or below, they're not bound to the mitzvot, right? The idea is that the parent is telling them after, as they grow up, that you shouldn't do that, etc. So, all right. So let's look at some of the halachic applications, which just gets back to Panina's. Panina always anticipates the uh, <laughs> the issue. Rubbing the ground. If you're rubbing the ground, that's technically an issue. Now, a person should not rub his shoe on un unpaved ground. You want you want to rub your shoe? You know, knock yourself out on the on the pavement. Uh, the Rama is Rabbi Moses Israelis, so he's commenting on the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, and this is uh, an opinion that he gives, which is, you know, Ashkenazim would be very focused on that. Uh, playing marbles on unpaved ground. Now you can say, well, that's extreme. It doesn't matter. I'm just, you know, we just have to look at, because the marbles will make paths. 
So you're, you're you know, many irrigation ditches, you know. So again, this is from the Rama, uh, cleaning the yard. A person should not sweep unpaved ground, uh, again, because you're improving the, the, the soil. This is from the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, cleaning the house, one may sweep inside houses and other paved areas. But there's a different issue that becomes of concern if you have a traditional uh, old style broom. And that is that a soft bristle broom should be used, you sh uh, should be used to avoid breaking the straw, which violates the prohibition on breaking a utensil. Well, it, it could happen to any, I mean, it, it's, it's valid for, it's valid for any, uh, the prohibition is valid for any type of straw or plastic straw. The issue is not breaking it. So the same thing actually, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, is actually toothbrushes. Uh, there, there's a different melacha, it's called memachek, it's smoothing skin. But if you think about it, when you brush your teeth, you're smoothing the surface of the, of the, of the teeth. So there are some orthodox that don't brush your teeth. And there are some orthodox that do, but they use a soft, uh, yeah, a, a soft brush. So, so uh, okay, so then the last one, technically, I mean, th again, some of these, they're not applicable because most people will not find themselves, but if you were in a third world country, maybe. Uh, technically, washing the floor should not be done in the house as a means of preventing washing an unpaved floor. So maybe if you lived in a different part of the world, that, that actually might be a concern. Uh, can we take a break? I need to go to the restroom. Sorry. Do we need to pause it or anything like that? Need to pause it for a second? No? Okay. Okay, so now we're back. So now we're getting to Kitsira. Did I have a picture for that one? Oh, I did not. Wait a minute. Oh, I forgot a picture for that one. I'll add that later. So this is uh, like harvesting. This is the word that we derive uh, from Kitsira, I believe. Uh, pulling out a plant from a fruit from its place of growth, even if you have the intention of eating it. This would be, according to halakha, would be uh, prohibited. So the melakha, as related to the mishkan, to the tabernacle, is as follows. The dyes that were used for the skins that covered the mishkan were derived from vegetables. The plants used for making the dyes had to be taken from the ground. So can you see that this is the third melakha that is related to the dyeing process in, in the tabernacle. So the ad melakha, the principal, or the father, if you will, of, the, of this particular melakha, is uh, cutting a plant or fruit from its place of origin using a sickle or any tool used to remove it from its original place of growth. So what would be a practical application today? If you're outside in the fruit tree or something like that and you grab an apple, even if you're gonna eat it, you're, you're breaking the connection, you're harvesting. So this is something that is prohibited uh, Well, shame on you for being lost in Shabbat. That's the first thing. No, it's good. No, but uh, uh, I mean, there are always, yeah, there's always. And I mean, if you want to look at that specific example, the halachot were in, I would suggest, not, um, I want to say necessarily as defined, but there were a lot of. Uh, back and forth on some of the details of, of uh, Melachot at that time. So, hmm? yes, yeah. so, but in, in any case, there were many different opinions regarding 
uh, you know, if you're eating at that moment, if you're picking something, but uh, yeah. So if, if you're lost in the woods, you know, that's a different category. I believe that there are different opinions, but I don't remember offhand. I've, uh, yes, but all this is ultimate, this is also from the Mishnah Barura. These are all, you know, from the Mishnah Barura is the uh, source, uh, the halachic source that Ashkenazim use today as the definitive basis for halacha. The uh, Shulchan Aruch is the definitive source that Sephardim and many Hasidim and so forth use. Uh, although sometimes Hasidim have other things that they use uh, as well. And, and there's all, there's other uh, halachic codes that kids are Shulchan Aruch, Shulchan Aruch. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're only doing with, you know, we're only dealing with situations that you're at home, you know, normal Shabbat situations. Okay, so now the next one is, uh, if you have a flower pot that has a hole at the bottom, and you take it away from a place in which can, it can, uh, I think it's supposed to be draw, I'm sorry. But I spell check everything. Draw nourishment and putting it, putting it instead of putting it down where it cannot do so. So anything that, if you're removing one thing, putting it in another area that will affect uh, the growth process, it's almost as if, if, if it has a hole at the bottom of the um, planter it, and it's connected to the ground, it's, you know, taking in something, you know, nutrients, right? So, if, yeah, you're taking it and then you've removed it from the original source. Um, so now we get into a lot of practical halachic applications. The first one is if you're removing an avocado pit from water that has produced roots. Now, why would you do that? I don't know, but uh, there are plenty of people, I guess, that do that. <laughs> so this is based off the uh, Shemirat Shabbat Kechilta, uh, the halachic source for uh, observance of Shabbat. Uh, removing a fish from water, since this, this is its uh, place of growth. Uh, yeah, uh, take, yeah, fishing. Uh, taking honey from a beehive. Of course, I don't know who, again, if you're not trying to do that, why you would do that, but uh, for the Shulchan Aruch, a smelling of fruit while it is attached to a tree. Now, why would you do that? Here, it's something that is, it's a fence. Why? Because your temptation would be to grab it and to take it. Well, the, if the flowers are detached, then it's not an issue. This is a very basic introduction. There's much more, as I said. Uh, yeah. It's, it, <laughs> but if you, if you remove, if you were to remove a flower, that would be problematic because you're cutting, you know, it's, it's, well, but it's, it, it is hard. It's, it's, it, yes. The removal is, is the, is the primary hala, uh, melacha, the ab melacha. Yeah, so then, uh, see. Um, and then if we look at uh, using a tree is prohibited. Now, now taking an already fallen fruit is prohibited, and this is, you could say, if you want to say a fence law, uh, to prevent a person from removing more fruit because, hey, you have a friend, something like that, you don't want to pick up more fruit. That's based off the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, and this is really, I mean, this is, this is halacha. Uh, using a tree is prohibited to prevent the possibility of breaking a tree branch. So let's say that you have a hammock. That would be something that would be prohibited. Uh, that's from the Shemirat Shabbat Kehilta. Uh, leaning on a tree with his or her full weight is prohibited if the tree is small and may lean. That's from the Mishnah Berurah. So if you have a small tree and that's something that might act, actually happen. It's interesting, our tree in our backyard, we have a peach tree and the peach tree died and it's almost at the point of, of falling over. Um, next one, sitting on a tree is prohibited as it, rela it, is, it is related to using a tree. Yes. Uh, climbing trees would be considered using the tree. It's, it's a tree stump, but uh, I'm talking about a regular tree. No, because if you, if you climb the tree and you break the branch, then you've harvested effect, effectively. Yeah. 
All right, so walking on grass is what we talked about at the beginning is permitted, but running on grass is not since it may uproot grass. And then we have sort of an unintentional harvesting or preparing, or it's related back to the previous melacha, which is preparing the ground for uh, planting. Uh, this is interesting. I think most people don't think about this. Riding an animal is prohibited, not because of the animal itself in this particular melacha, but because most people, if you think about it, if you're back to my donkey story, you would have had a stick or something that you would have used to, to motivate the donkey to move along. And so the Shulchan Aruch says, you know, you don't want to do that because you might break the stick. So sometimes the melachot, well, yeah, but it's interesting that every melacha sort of stands on its own. So that melacha is related to that particular issue. So it's, this is just on Shabbat, yeah. In, this is on Shabbat. <laughs> this is this is on Shabbat in Orthodox settings, or if it were you know whatever level of observance a person has. All right, imur, it's from the word amar, uh, imar, which is to uh, to gather together. So of course these are bundles of hay or whatever that is. The principle of the malacha is gathering harvest to produce or, or produce in one pile. And again, in the Mishkan, in the tabernacle, the, the relationship to this was that the dyes were used, were, uh, that were used in the Mishkan were gathered together in bunches after the harvest. And then the Ab Melacha is uh, gathering harvested grain and then putting it in one place. Uh, you know, we take it from its place of growth and then we, we transfer it to somewhere else. So the Toladot or the Tolados is uh, sort of out in that sen this sense. But let's say that we are uh, taking dried fruits, such as figs, and we're putting it in one mass. Uh, this prohibition applies even when it is done in the home, because we don't want to do anything that is similar to uh, the prohibition. It's from Mishneh, uh, the Mishneh Barura. Um, and uh, halahak applications, you have scattered fruit in the garden or field, should not be gathered together since it appears to be the place of growth. If it's on the floor, on the ground, you don't want to move it from that place. One may, however, gather fruit and vegetables that scattered in the house, since, this is, uh, since, this, since they are not typically gathered in the house into bundles. And even, uh, you can even place peanuts and other items in, in, in bags to throw at a chatan, a bridegroom, uh, on, on Shabbat before his wedding. So for example, if, uh, for bar mitzvahs, uh, I'm sure you've seen some people throw candy and things like that. Uh, that would be a sort of a similar case that you could do that. You, you can, yeah, it's an, yeah, if you can do that, yes. So if it's scattered and you have fruit all over, you can put it together. It's sufficiently different from the source. So uh, Disha, so now uh, what this depicts is you've gathered your grain and now they're beating it because they want to separate the, the wheat and the chaff. So the old, old style. Fresh. So the principle of this malacha is breaking the physical connection between the desired and the undesired parts of the whole. Uh, in, in the Mishkan, again, back to the plants that were used to prepare dyes, they were separated from the rest of the plants that were gathered. So the principle, the father of the av malacha, the principle of malacha is using a utensil uh, to separate the desired part from the undesired part. An example of this would be a garlic press to separate the usable part of the garlic from the shell. Now there are exceptions, however. Separating the desired part from the undesired part by hand, when this is the standard method of separation, but there are exceptions as we'll look at in a second. Uh, for example, with nuts. If you want to eat nuts, you can actually crush the nut as long as you're doing it one at a time and it's for immediate consumption. Yes. Bananas? It is, uh, those, it's different. So you would never, uh, it's different because those are already, um, I guess you could say they're, they're already in full form. So that's sort of, the, you know, the wheat is, yes, the wheat is in, enveloped and mixed with chaff and so forth, but you can never, I'm trying to find like the right explanation for that. But it doesn't apply to, to bananas or to fruit. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, milking a cow actually is something that is prohibited because it separates the milk from the animal. That's a, per that's a personal problem. <laughs> the personal problem for the cow. <laughs> How did they do it? 
I don't know. We didn't study agriculture in the, <laughs> in the yeshiva at that level. Well, but I think, uh, I mean, don't, don't the baby cows drink the milk, right? I don't think in most contexts that was the case. I don't think that was the case in most, I mean, if, 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 if you're a small farmer, you're going to have to have, yeah, multiple cows. That, yeah, that would, I'd have to look that. Well, then you would have, you have other concerns by using a machine. You have ele use electricity, you have all the other prohibitions. So that's a question that we can look up. Huh? Well, it, yeah, it would be interesting to find out what they do, but uh, that would be different from as it relates to halakha. So squeezing, now this is something that most people don't know, um, squeezing water out of a cloth for the sake of the water. And this actually becomes an issue when you're washing dishes. So there are actually specific types of washcloths or wash uh, utensils that are often recommended, like silicone type, uh, so that they don't absorb, which is another malacha. Uh, well, brush, yeah, there's, there's also like a plain one that's like a circle. It's just like one piece. Instead of using like, uh, exactly, even, even steel wool. Uh, squeezing by hand or uh, utensil, olives or grapes to make oil and wine. Uh, since that is separating uh, juice from the fruit. So that's, that should be pretty obvious. But it's different for juice and olives than it is for something like uh, orange or something like that. Uh, okay, so let's look at, now we get into uh, more examples. These are, uh, you know, practical examples. I referenced cracking nuts, but let's look at almonds. Uh, certain types of almonds, green almonds, have a green peel around the regular shell. One may not remove this peel unless it is removed along with the shell when the almond is cracked. And this is from the Rabbi Moses Israelis and the Mishnah Berurah. Um, for the most part, um, it's permissible to eat nuts, as I mentioned, um, even though the physical connection between the desired and undesired parts is, by, is broken immediately before they are eaten. Uh, but the fact that you're eating it at specifically, you know, you're cracking and you're eating, that's what characterizes, characterizes it as a, an exception. Uh, the discussion comes about because this is not the standard method of disha, uh, which involves long-term storage. So you're eating it for immediate consumption, uh, and then it also adds, the Mishnah Baruch adds that the nuts are also cracked one at a time. All right, so this is a couple more examples. Uh, Kalahic application, squeezing juice into a cup. It is forbidden to squeeze the juice of any fruit into an empty vessel. The prohibition applies to squeezing by hand as well. It also applies to squeezing lemon lemons, uh, despite the fact that lemon juice is not typically drunk in an in unmixed form. And that's also from the Mishnah Barura. Um, it is permitted to squeeze juice from a fruit directly onto food if the juice is absorbed by the solid food. So if you're eating uh, fish or steak or something like that, you know, you cut your lemon and you put it over the uh, steak or whatever, uh, fish, uh, it's fine because it's not considered separate. You're taking it from a solid form and then you're putting it onto another solid form. Uh, it is as if the solid had been squeezed into another solid. Uh, the juice may be squeezed directly onto the food. Um, yeah, I think I haven't heard any, uh, I don't think there's any deviation. So uh, cutting a grapefruit, uh, grapefruit may be cut in half and eaten normally, even though, sorry about the thought, even though the juice will ultimately be squeezed. This is permitted since the primary goal is the entire fruit and not simply the juice. Yeah, that, that applies also to grapes. Uh, I think that's the next one. Uh, only squeezing grapes. Well, the one that's an exception is the grape because you can make wine. So there's, there's a concern there, uh, even though you're not fermenting it and so forth. But um, only squeezing grapes presents a direct Torah prohibition. All of the other ones are secondary, if you want to. Uh, that one I don't know, to be honest. I think it's directly making uh, wine. It may have been used um, in, the, uh, in the Mishkan. There were, there were korbanot, the sacrifices and so forth. Um, consequently, one may not hold a grape and attempt to uh, suck out, sorry about that, out the juice without eating the grape. In contrast, one may hold an orange and suck out the juice. Because... 
Yes, you can put it in your mouth. You can suck it in your mouth. Just don't try to hold it, you know. Yeah, that's from the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, ice cubes, one may put ice cubes in his or her drink on Shabbat. This despite the fact that the ice will melt into the liquid. This is acceptable because liquid is not considered as an independent entity. And uh, this is an example of a, an olive press. Of course, you know, old style. Um, that's a practical application of Disha. And then you can also look at, um, uh, you know, treading grapes. You know, they would put grapes and people would step on them with their feet. Um, and that's another application of that. Um, let's see how much more we have. I think we can stop at Disha maybe and then, do the, you know, continue on with Zuria. So Disha, this is the, we'll stop there if that's all right. Um, this is where I was talking about washing dishes. Using a wet cloth. Uh, many will not. Maybe some do. But uh, using a wet cloth for cleaning dishes involves the tolada of Disha. This prevents the use of cloth, sponge, Scotch-Brite, steel wool, since the water is absorbed between the fibers. You can use one if it doesn't have, um, it doesn't have a lot of liquid on it. There's some that are sort of dry. They're not dry, but they're, they're moist, but it doesn't spread out liquid. So that's where you get around that, huh? for the towelette. Um, uh, since water is absorbed between the fibers, uh, squeezed out to aid in the washing, a loosely woven plastic scrubber is permitted, however. I was thinking about putting an example of some silicone ones that I found. Uh, you know, I might add that for future reference for people looking back at this, because uh, there's some that are specifically designed to not have these uh, issues. And then wet towelettes, um, the way to get around that, again, is if you have some that don't have a lot of moisture, you know, they have some moisture, but they're not, you know, if you squeeze it out, it's not going to, it's Disha. Well, it's, uh, we're, we're separating one thing from another. Yeah. Because, uh, to the, to the temple? Oh, because we were separating the plants from other plants that we're going to be using the dyeing process. So it's separating one thing from another. So if you're separating uh, the juice from a grape, if you're separating the juice or the oil from an olive, if you're separating water from the from the towel, anything like that. It's all about separation. You're separating the nut from the shell, but you're eating the nut at that point, and it's fine. Okay? And so let me just look real quick. Oh, yeah. So we looked at that. And squeezing hair. Huh? I'm sorry? I uh, can't. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there, there, there are different elements that are involved. So here we're only dealing with the, the category of you've got uh, water in your hair and you're, you know, doing the... Uh, oh, you, I mean, I'm, people have to do with, you know... Or, 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 but there's also other issues. If, if, you know, that are non-related, if you're showering, you should not be using hot water, according to most opinions. You can take a cold shower. But there are some people say, well, you know, it, 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 is it, yeah, so there are different issues of concern. So, and then what, how are you, how are you, uh, you know, applying soap? Is it something that's a soft, you know, scrubber? I mean, there's a lot of different issues there. So. That's a stricter approach.
So there were a lot of different opinions about that in the history of um, But there was one historical opinion that um, was kind of historical that said um, that there were no children carried on Shabbat in order to go to this time. So, so this is the thing. So it didn't matter because you didn't have to carry children on Shabbat, so this time it doesn't to be the opinion of the book that we need. That the minority opinion is just it is it is global that has been passed or has been found with that that means that by using the same logic, so you know we can go with the scripture or we can go with I feel like it's more logical. I feel like for me, I feel like it's not hmm? Well, I, I would say that this is not Hasidic Judaism. It's it would be what we would call, uh, you know, you know, Haredi, modern Orthodox. You know, the, modern Orthodox is problematic because there's so many different facets to that. But if somebody, you know, this is nothing abnormal that you would find in, uh, yeah. If you're going Shari Tefillah, if you're going to or uh, Hortora, yeah, Magen David, any of these places here in Dallas. This is, you know, they're going to be doing that. This is normative. I'll give you, I, I had a discussion, I mean, I'll, I'll uh, you know, they, um, Stephen and I were talking about, uh, this is another melacha about, you know, tearing, uh, you know, toilet paper on Shabbat, and he was telling me that he tears it with his mouth or something like that, or it's tea. I'm just joking, I'm just joking, I'm just joking, but I said, listen, you know, when my sister came over uh, to spend time with me on Shabbat and stayed at my house, I had Kleenex, everything was separated, everything was done, uh, because, you know, this is, this is my sister and this is something that, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had everything ready. I unscrewed the, uh, light in the refrigerator. I had, everything was set up. So if you don't know these things at the very minimum, you cannot be sensitive to people in your family, to your friends or someone who, who adheres to that perspective. So whatever you hold individually, that's between you and Hashem. But you have to understand different communities have different standards, and uh, it doesn't mean that they're illegitimate, but you need to know what those are. And so, it's something that you should know. This is part of a, a traditional Jewish education. So, whatever you do with them or not, you should know the basics. Yeah, and these are basics, to be quite honest. So, um, Yeah, as you're rubbing the ground with your foot, drying your hair, you know, uh, <laughs> put, pulling pulling uh, apples from trees. <laughs> I think that there would, I believe that there would be Ashkenazim that would be stricter about that. No, I think I, I think I've heard that before. I think. So uh, we'll stop there, but we have 39 categories to go through. It's quite a bit. Uh, and then if we want in the future, uh, we can actually look at other aspects of Shabbat observance that are not directly related to the melachot. They're more in terms of uh, what I would call practical observance as related to davening, you know, uh, you know, kiddush, things of that nature that, that may or may not, uh, may or may not be familiar with. So, all right, so we'll stop there. And uh, we need to stop it. Yeah. No? <laughs> we need to stop it.